All right, would you please take your Bibles this evening and turn with me uh, in the Old Testament book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And uh, we have been uh, going uh, through uh, this uh, book of Genesis. And uh, maybe it's uh, a starting point, maybe we'll just work our way through the rest of the Bible, right? Amen. <laughs> All right. Yeah, some, uh, uh, some people like uh, Revelation, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll get there eventually. You know, if the Lord uh, tarries his coming, we'll get there. Well, we are in Genesis chapter number 33, and uh, before we read our text this morning, we know that r is about to happen a meeting between Jacob and Esau, and it's been 20 years uh, since over 20 years since they last saw each other, and the last time they saw each other didn't go very well. Uh, Esau wanted to kill Jacob uh, because of how uh, Jacob had handled the whole situation. We know that Esau was a carnal man. Hebrews 11 tells us he was a profane man, a profane fornicator. That's the kind of man he was, uninterested in spiritual things. And so although Jacob was interested in spiritual things, he did not go about doing it the right way. And so it's been 20 years, and now the meeting is about to happen. And we know that before this meeting, much has taken place, as or not, in the life of Jacob. Jacob has been humbled. And we've uh, clearly established that from the, time, the moment he left Canaan to the time now that he's returning to Canaan. It's been 20 years. And we know that God has worked on Jacob. And we establish the truth that the work that God is seeking to accomplish in the life of Jacob and in the life of every individual is a humbling work. That's what God is trying to do, by the way, in our lives today. He's trying to humble us, and we know that there are several things that God used in the life of Jacob to humble him. We've established that God chastened Jacob. The chastening of the Lord humbled Jacob. You remember what he did towards Esau was dealt to him, him in greater measure. You reap what you sow, and you always reap more than you sow. We saw that the trials of this life that God allowed Jacob to go through would humble Jacob. We saw also that the goodness of God would humble Jacob. Despite all that was done to Jacob uh, when he was in Haran, we know that God used despite those things and still blessed Jacob. And so that would certainly be something that would humble Jacob. But before we come to Genesis 33 and Genesis 32, we find a fourth way that God used to <coughs> humble Jacob, and that is through a direct confrontation with God. We know that uh, there was a, a man who wrestled with Jacob at the end of Genesis 32, and Jacob declared as he ends uh, this meeting here with this man that was wrestling with him, he says, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And so that was a direct intervention from God in the life of Jacob just before his meeting with Esau. And so understand what's happened. It took 20 years for God to prepare Jacob for this meeting. And I believe that this was truly God's preparation because as we're going to look at our passage this evening, we're going to find that the outcome of this passage is unexpected. It truly is not what we expected going into it. And so, as we begin our reading this evening, notice Genesis 33, verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. Now, right off the bat, it doesn't look good, does it? Because, now pretend you don't know the rest of the story. <laughs> pretend you only know what you know up to this point. Jacob is coming with 400 men with him, the last time he said he would kill Jacob. And the Bible says, And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaidens. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, and they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also and her children came near and bowed themselves and came near 
And, and after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all the, this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my, pres uh, my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, and he urged him, and he took it. And he said, Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children uh, be able to endure until I come unto my Lord and to Sire. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee, thee some of the flocks that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Sire. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place was called Succoth. And Jacob came to Shalem, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came to Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elahor Israel. Now as we consider this passage, we are particularly focusing on the first part of Genesis chapter number 20, uh, 33. And what we observe in Genesis 33 after 20 years is this, <clears throat> a different Jacob. It's a different man. Uh, he has been affected. He, he has been changed. And I believe that as we look at the life of Jacob in Genesis 33, it looks much different than his life had looked 20 years previous. And by the way, I believe that in the life of a believer, by application, that as we grow in our years, that things ought to look different in our lives. It ought not to be the same. I believe with all my heart that as Christians, if we look back in our lives 20 years ago, I hope that there is some measure of difference in our lives from 20 years ago. That is true in the life of Jacob. Now, has he arrived? No, but we see a clear difference. And I would like to note those differences in our study this evening. We come to a, if you would, up to this point, has been a dreaded meeting between Jacob and Esau. Uh, it's been 20 years. Uh, Jacob had learned here that Esau, according to Genesis 32, was coming with 400 men. And by the way, the only reason why he's coming with 400 men is to inflict harm. There's no other reason for that. And so he comes with 400 men uh, to um, meet Jacob. And so a meeting is about to take place. Uh, but understand, I believe with all my heart that Esau is still the same man. Because the New Testament summarizes the life of Esau as he was a profane uh, fornicator. Earlier we saw that Esau was a man of the field. And we saw that in contrast to Jacob. Sometimes if we're not careful, we think when the Bible says that Jacob was a dweller in tents and Esau was a man of the field. We get the misunderstanding that uh, Esau was out working and Jacob was out in his tent kind of being lazy. But the opposite is true. Esau being a man of the field simply means that he was a man who left his responsibilities at home. He went out and uh, basically indulged in all his fleshly appetites. While Jacob stayed home and fulfilled his responsibility and was a hardworking man. And that is the truth because when we see Jacob going to Haran, God blessed Laban because of Jacob. He was a hardworking man. And that is evident because Laban even recognized Jacob and he took full advantage of Jacob's hard work. And so we know the kind of man in Esau is, is Esau. And so I believe that if we come to Genesis 32, Esau is still the same man, but Jacob is not. Jacob has been changed. 
He has been humbled. You know, there's a proverb that says, in Proverbs 18, verse 19, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. Now think about that. That's a proverb, and certainly that would be true between Esau and Jacob. Esau has been offended, and by the way, rightfully so. Now, he was not a godly man. He was not interested in the things of the Spirit of God, but it does not give, it did not give the right for Jacob to do what he did. He was a deceiver. He was a, 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 trick, a, a trickster, and he deceived and he lied to his brother and to his father, and we see that. And so Esau has been clearly offended, but here in this passage we find that Jacob is going to go out of his way to restore the situation. We find in our passage this dreaded meeting turned out to actually be a wonderful experience. And I believe a lesson that we can learn in, if you would, the genuine signs of a changed life, according to Jacob. We first know, we notice two things this uh, evening. First, we're going to look at this meeting uh, between uh, Jacob and Esau, and then we're going to look secondly at the restoring between Jacob and Esau. Notice, consider the meeting first of all. In verse number one, as we begin our study, the Bible says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he, that's Jacob, divided the children unto Leah, and unto Rachel, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. Now, we come to uh, this meeting here. The, this is the moment. The manner in which both of these men came to this meeting is, I believe, reflected of their character. The Bible describes the surroundings or the people with Esau and the people with Jacob. On the one hand, Esau had 400 men with him. We don't see any children or women or cattle or flocks. We don't see any of that. It is 400 men with him, while Jacob, on the, on the other hand, came with his family and livestock. A different scene, isn't there? On the one hand, it looks like there's a man who's coming out to battle. And on the other hand, it seems like this is just a family gathering. While Jacob had been enlarging his flocks in the last 20 years, Esau had been enlarging his army. There's a different life going on between these two men. According to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, as we already noted, we know that Esau was a profane man who despised the things of God, while Jacob, although going about it the wrong way, valued spiritual blessings and privileges. He did. And we come to verse 2, the Bible says, And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. There is a, really no secret here in the order of, uh, of, uh, of the placement, if you would, of the different and various family members. This was certainly done in order of those who were most precious to Jacob. Consider Jacob's favored family, Rachel and Joseph, were all the way to the back, the most protected then, uh, the, uh, then it was Lee and her children, and then the handmaids and their children. And so that sim is simply laid out in order of imp importance and favorability. Uh, but it is interesting to note that here, Joseph's name is mentioned twice in the passage, while no other sons of Jacob are mentioned. We often find this pattern in the Word of God where we are introduced to a certain character that we're going to revisit again. As we saw, if you remember... Uh, when uh, the servant of Abraham went out to go find a wife for his son Isaac, uh, Rebekah is mentioned, but also her brother Laban. No other family member is mentioned uh, that uh, we know of apart from the father there, uh, but uh, we have the mention of Laban, and the reason for that is because God introduces us to Laban because we're going to revisit Laban later when Jacob comes on the scene. And so God here introduces us to Joseph because we're going to see uh, Joseph later in the subsequent chapters. Uh, we, we are going to hone in on him. And so this is the prized son of Jacob as we know. And we know that Joseph was going to be used of God to preserve the nation of Israel through a worldwide famine. Now, in verse 3, 
I want you to notice here, because as this meeting draws close, we see the two different groups coming uh, to meet one another, and Jacob is uh, basically trying to lay things out uh, to protect uh, those family members who are uh, most important to him in verse 3, and notice what happens in verse 3. Although it seems that Jacob has orchestrated this thing, something happens at that moment in verse 3. He says, and he passed over before them. That's before who? Before the three groups. That means before Rachel and Joseph, which was the group all the way to the back, Leah and her sons, which was the second group, and the first group, who, that would be the first to meet Esau, which would be the handmaids and their sons. And so what Jacob does is he goes, he uh, passes over before them, and notice he comes to Esau and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now I'm, interesting, uh, I'm interested here in two uh, uh, two things about Jacob in this meeting with Esau. Two things that grab my attention concerning Jacob that I believe we first know the change in his life in this meeting. First of all, I believe that we see Jacob's faith was evident. You see, how do we see that? Well, notice verse 3. And he, that's Jacob, passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now, uh, sometimes, and really in some of the uh, commentaries, it seems that some people say, well, Jacob was kind of uh, hanging out the rear, and he was kind of uh, a little coward, cowardly, if you would, to be in the back and to send everything before him. But here the Bible makes a note that uh, Jacob passed before them. He actually stood in front of all these, uh, all these groups of families that were separated in three stages, and he went and he personally met Esau first before the other ones. Now we know the gifts had already been set, and so I believe that this testifies of Jacob's faith. Jacob's courage is evident in this passage, and his courage can only come from a faith in God. You see, I believe that his courage came from his faith in the Lord and in the Lord's promises, Jacob went forward to meet Esau. Now, was he afraid? Of course he was afraid. He said so, in the, uh, you remember, and we'll revisit that prayer uh, this uh, evening in Genesis 32 when Jacob prayed specifically he, in this prayer to God. He says, for I fear my brother Esau. He was afraid. But yet, when we come to Genesis 33, he passes everyone and he's not standing in the back Cowardly waiting, he is walking before everyone to meet his brother Esau. And I believe that testifies, as we think about Jacob being a courageous man, I believe that his courage is rooted in his faith. You know this idea today that people of faith are weak people is so contrary to the word of God. The people of courage today are the people of faith. And if you study history just a little while, you would find that the people of faith have always been the people who have been willing to lay down their lives for the Word of God and for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And their faith has always been demonstrated by courage. And so we know Jacob's faith was evident. But secondly, I believe we see Jacob's yielding was evident. What I'd like to note here is Jacob's behavior because it seems so contrary to what we know Jacob to be. But hence, the work of God. You see, we notice three things about Jacob in this passage. Number one, in verse three, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. In verse four, Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the Bible says, and they wept. Now oh, that's interesting. They don't seem to be a good combination for a time of weeping, you know, tears of joy. It doesn't seem like they're the types of guys for that. But that's what happens. And then in verse 5, and he lifted up his eyes, that's uh, Esau, and he saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Now, it is interesting here that there's three things that come out as I, we, we look at the life of Jacob this evening. Is first of all, he seems to be a submitted man. He is bowing himself to his brother seven times on his way to meet him. And then you find the second scene is in the behavior of Jacob is that he's weeping. 
And I believe these were uh, uh, weeping uh, of joy, if you would. Just uh, they, they were embracing one another. And so you see the joy demonstrated. But also you see a third thing at the end of verse 5. Uh, for the first time, it seems that Jacob is a thankful man. As Esau says, hey, who are these? And he says, the children that God hath graciously given me. He doesn't say, well, that's the family I got for myself. He says, that's what God has given me. Now, there's three things that I note about the life of Jacob. He seems to be submitted, humble, if you would. He seems to have joy, and he seems to be thankful. Now, there's something that we observe in the Word of God. There's a pattern the Bible talks about in the New Testament about the life that is yielded to the Spirit of God. The life of the man that is filled with the Spirit of God has a is manifested by certain things in their lives. I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter number 5. Because what we find happening in the life of Jacob after a meeting with God, now remember what was this meeting with God about? The meeting with God was a man was wrestling with Jacob until the breaking of the day. And we know that uh, uh, Jacob was first winning that wrestling match, but then he ended up losing because God crippled him. And so at that moment, Jacob became dependent upon God. And so at that moment, he became, if you would, dependent upon God. When God says, when you lost the fight, you actually now have power with God and with man, and you have prevailed. But I believe in that moment that uh, uh, Jacob became yielded to God where he stopped going his own way and he yielded himself to God. Now Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 18, the Bible says, well, if you go back to verse number 17, the Bible says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So as believers, we have to understand what is the will of God. What is the will of God? Verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know what, it, what it, the will of God is for every one of our lives is for us to be filled with the Spirit of God? Amen. Another uh, expression we could use as be, with, for being filled with the Spirit of God is being yielded to the Spirit of God. Amen. To be completely yielded and uh, given to uh, the will of God in our lives. And so those who are filled with the Spirit of God, notice what happens then in verse 19, 20, and 21. This is the overflow, if you would, the outcome of someone who is filled with the Spirit of God, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, here the Apostle Paul writes to the believers at Ephesus and he says that the will of God is for you to be filled with the Spirit of God. And those who are filled with the Spirit of God, there are three things that are going to be manifested with those who are filled with the Spirit of God. The first one in verse 19 is joy. The second one in verse 20 is thankfulness. And the third one in verse 20, 21 is submission. I think that is interesting that as Jacob gave up his life to the control of God. Those three things were manifested in his life. And so today in the life of the believer who is yielded to the Spirit of God, those three things are evident in that life. You see in the first one in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the joy of the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness. In verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I want you to go back with me to Genesis 33 now. We've looked at this as a New Testament pattern of someone who is filled with the Spirit of God. And here in the New Testament, as Jacob just had his encounter with God, and he has basically said, God, you can control me. You can have preeminence in my life. And here in Genesis 33, we find those three things present. The first one is submission in verse 3. And he passed over before them, and notice, and Jacob bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Submission. Jacob, 20 years ago, had self-asserted himself. That's what he did. Now, did he, did he desire the right thing? Yeah, he desired the blessing. That's a wonderful thing. But he went about doing it the wrong way. He lied and connived and tricked his way through it. He self-asserted himself. 
But now he's not self-asserting himself. He's submitting himself to his brother. He bows seven times. The idea of repeating uh, means, speaks of his sincerity. It speaks that he wanted to be no mistake, that he is not here to self-assert himself over his brother, who was, by the way, the firstborn, but he was there to demonstrate his submission. He calls Esau his Lord. That is interesting. By the way, that would be the right thing to do because Esau was the firstborn and he was the one who was to receive the honor. And so now Jacob, instead of taking the honor from him as he had previously done, now he gives them that honor. Uh, then we find in verse number 4, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And notice, they wept. Can you imagine that scene here, that reunion? Uh, as we look at those two groups coming, here you have Jacob and all of his family and his cattle and his herd. And on the other side you have Esau and his little army and they're about to meet and here uh, Jacob comes out and as, as you see maybe the two groups on each end stopping, uh, then uh, Jacob comes forward and he passes everyone and here Esau is at the front and, and everybody is kind of paused at that moment and Jacob is slowly making his way and every other step or every so often he stops Stops to bow himself before his brother. He wants to make uh, clear to everyone uh, that he is uh, submitted, that he has been humbled seven times. And as they meet, you find now an embrace, a weeping, tears of joy in this wonderful reunion. And then in verse 5, as Esau inquires about the women and the children, and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, This is Jacob, notice, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. You see, in, that, in those few words, uh, Jacob has simply demonstrated how thankful he is to God for blessing him. But understand that this is only in connection to the end of Genesis 32. When Jacob has yielded himself to the control of God. And now there's evidence in the life of Jacob to show that he has yielded control to God. You see, the opposite is true of those who do not yield control to God. They're not humble. They're not submissive. They're not thankful because they always want more. And there's certainly no joy there. Because the flesh is never satisfied. You see, Jacob only got to the place of humility, of thankfulness, and of true joy when he yielded himself to God. You know, when I grew up in, as I think back on my life and testimony, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a, uh, was a, was a preacher. And um, as a young teenager, I uh, told myself after being observing, if you would, ministry and, and people and in my young mind of not understanding what was going on, not understanding why my parents uh, kept serving God despite uh, people's actions towards them. And I said to myself as a young teenager, I will never serve God. And I went about in my younger teenage years uh, to go about and to say, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing. Now, I still went to church. We still had the family devotions. We still did the things that we always did. But my heart was far removed from God. It was, it was so, so far removed from God uh, that as I did what I wanted to do and had my own ambitions and my own friends and my own passions, I did those things. And yet, as I did the things that I wanted to do, I found myself to be a miserable person. I found myself coming home after school one day with no one home, and I literally came inside my bedroom. I laid on my bed, and I began beating on my chest, and I said, God, get out of my heart. I was doing what I wanted to do, and yet I was miserable. I believe the Lord, through the set of circumstances and difficulties in the ministry, allowed my family when I was 16 years old to come back to the States, and God used a message to speak to my heart. And it was actually Brother John O'Malley was preaching with Brother Westone at a um, missionary family camp. And I remember them preaching a message, and I can't remember which man it was, but preaching a message on grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And I realized I had grieved the Holy Spirit of God. 
And I remember going forward on the altar after the message, and I don't remember every detail of the message, but I remember saying, God, I completely surrender my life. I want to do what you want me to do in my life. And when I completely yielded myself, in a moment, peace and joy stepped in. It was contrary to everything the world knows. You, I did what I wanted to do, and I was miserable. But as soon as I said, God, I'll do what you want me to do, joy stepped in at that moment. You see, it is the same today. It is the same in the life of Jacob, and it is true in our lives today. When we self-assert ourselves through this life, we become of all men most miserable. But the moment we yield control to God and say, God, I want your will to be done in my life, in that moment, the joy of the Lord comes in. And so it's a different scene. You see, we find a submitted Jacob, a joyous Jacob, a thankful Jacob. But something happens that is unexpected, and that is the other party. Now, we know that God has worked in the life of Jacob. He's humbled him, and now it seems to us that Jacob is a different man just by his behavior that has been demonstrated in this meeting. But now what is peculiar to me is Esau's compassion. Seems to be unexpected, doesn't it? I mean, this is Esau. This is the profane fornicator. This is the one who said, I will kill my brother. Uh, this is the man who, as we look at his life, was a wicked and a vile man. That's who he was. But the Bible tells us in verse 4 that as Esau looks at his brother who is bowing himself on his way seven times to uh, come near to his brother, the Bible says in verse 4, and Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. Understand, let's not, this is not Jacob doing the running and the embracing. It is Esau. Who's running? It is Esau who, notice, is embracing, who is falling on his neck, and who is kissing him. That's Esau doing that. And the Bible says, and they wept together. Now, there are several things I want to consider about Esau and this compassion, if you would, because if we are honest with ourselves, we find in this passage that Esau could have just said, Attack! <laughs> and that would have been over. But he didn't do that. By doing that, perhaps he came with the intentions of going to battle, but something happened in the life of Esau that he ran, and by running he demonstrated to the men that were with him, we're changing plans. We're not going to follow through with what we're going to plan on doing. And his demonstration of his affection is much like the demonstration of the affection that we find in the prodigal son. If you remember when the prodigal son was coming back, the prodigal son was the one who was wrong. He was the one that had sinned. But the father is the one who ran to meet him. And according to Jewish law at that time, and that was a Jewish boy, according to Jewish law, that father had the right to take his son in the middle of the town and stone him to death. But by his father running to his son to meet him, he demonstrated to all the people who will be observing that I've accepted my son, and it doesn't matter what he's done. So this is much like that scene. Now, I'm not comparing Esau to Jesus Christ. Nothing could be further from Christ than Esau. I understand that. But what we see here in Esau demonstrating his compassion towards Jacob, it's very unlikely. There's four things about his compassion. First of all, his eagerness. The Bible, Esau ran to meet him. Secondly, his embrace. Esau embraced him. Thirdly, his endearment. Esau kissed him. And fourthly, his emotion, they wept. But I want us to consider that there are two things that we assuredly attribute to the success of this encounter. The two things are this. Jacob's action, which we have noted, I believe changed the heart of Esau in that moment. You know, there are many proverbs that tells us how to deal with the wicked. Well, a simple answer is, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And many of the proverb talks about how we deal with the wicked. Answer, not a fool in his folly. 
And so here, notice uh, uh, Jacob as he comes. Uh, uh, certainly we understand that there is precedence in the, in the Word of God, in the Proverbs on how to deal with those who are profane people, those who are wicked. And Jacob does that as he's yielded to God and his, I believe his actions are, uh, are, must be attributed to the success in the encounter. But there's a second thing. I believe it was Jacob's praying which we must remember. Notice in chapter 32. I want us to recall Jacob's prayer in Genesis 32. Notice verse number 11. The Bible says as Jacob prays, notice, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Now I want you to notice as we've uh, noticed, note, noted that in the past, it's not a long prayer. <coughs> right? Two verses. As a matter of fact, the majority of the praying in the Bible is rather short. Sincere short prayers are always better than insincere long prayers. I'd rather the short of prayer of a man who doesn't know how to speak than the eloquent man who prays and goes on and on and on and has no concern or regard for God. And here in this simple prayer, in those simple two verses, a simple prayer from Esau. And I want us to notice three things in this prayer because I believe that this encounter with Esau and the change we find in Esau is not only the fact that Jacob's behavior change and his action would commend a change in the life of Esau, but also I believe that there is a spiritual work going on. God has intervened already on behalf of Jacob, has he not? Right? With Laban, uh, the relationship there. And here uh, certainly there would be an intervention. And this is a simple prayer. And we notice three things. Notice verse 11 again. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother and the mother with the children. First of all, in this prayer, uh, he, uh, Jacob recognizes God's power. Those simple words. Deliver me. What wonderful words. He, he doesn't go on and on and on about the problem. He just prays, deliver me. That's it. And so we see that in this simple prayer, he recognizes the power of God, that God has the power to deliver him. Uh, now we know that previously, in the previous chapter, we find that, remember, God directly appeared uh, to uh, in a dream to Laban and he says you better not touch Jacob and so we already know that God has been involved in delivering Jacob and here Jacob just prays deliver me and so he simply recognizes the power of God he recognizes that God can intervene on his behalf and so he simply asks God he says uh, notice Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the, and the mother with the children. And then in verse 12 he says, And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Not only does uh, Jacob recognize God's power, but he also recognizes his weakness. I fear him. <laughs> so far we can sum up this prayer by this. Deliver me, recognizing the power of God. I fear Him, recognizing your own weakness. And that's what Jacob does in this prayer. You see, when we come into prayer, that's what we must recognize. His power, our weakness. But there's a third thing that Jacob does. And in verse 12, is that he reiterated God's promises. He says, and thou saidest, I will surely do thee good. He says, God, this is what you've told me. That you will do me good and make my seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That's what you said. 
By the way, God wants us to reiterate the promises that he's made to us. That's why he gave them to us. So that we could remember them and speak them. And so as we think about how, uh, how, how can, what do we attribute the success of this encounter? I believe two things that we find directly in our context. The actions of Jacob and the praying of Jacob. And ultimately understand that that means that God was intervening. Because remember, it was God that changed Jacob. It was God that humbled Jacob. And as Jacob prayed to God, he prayed for God to deliver him because he knew within himself that God is the one who has all power and he is, all, he is but weakness. So we attribute the success of this encounter to God. You see, in our lives as we behave, our actions, I believe, reflect of the humbling that God has done in our lives. The humbling work that God has done in our lives. And through the praying, we remember what God has done. And so... Any success that takes place in our lives can only be attributed to God because of the work that He does in us and the work that we've asked Him to do as we reiterate His promises. So that's the first part. That's the meeting. But I want us to consider secondly when we're done and the second part will not be as long as the first, I promise. But that is the restoring. If you notice... In Genesis 32, Jacob is going to go out of his way to give, really, an overabundance of gifts to Esau. As a matter of fact, it seems to me a little out of control. Notice in verse number 9, And Esau said, I have, uh, or verse 8, And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in, thy, in, in the sight of my Lord. Now understand what Jacob is thinking. He's thinking 20 years earlier. Jacob was the one who, was, who lied, who deceived, who tricked his way into getting the blessing. We understand that Jacob wanted the right thing and desired the right thing, but he went about it the wrong way. And so you see what Jacob is doing here, he's trying to make that right. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. Uh, for therefore I have seen thy face, as though I have seen the face of God, and thou, hast, uh, thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing, and that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, Let me take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. You see, Jacob knows that he was wrong in his dealing with his brother Esau. We find in the passage a, a, passage, a desire on the part of Jacob to restore to some measure the wrong that he's done to Esau. Jacob does not feel bad for desiring the blessing. But he does feel bad for how he dealt with Esau in going about to get the blessing. You see, when we examine our lives, we must never excuse our wrong behavior, even though it might be motivated for the right thing. And Jacob here seeks to make things right. Uh, Esau, at first, seems to refuse the gift, but then Jacob persists in giving the gift. And really as we examine this gift a few messages ago. We understood that this gift seems to be extravagant. It seems to be beyond what is reasonable. But certainly to Jacob perhaps his mindset was fourfold. That reminds me of something. Reminds me of Luke 19. The man Zacchaeus who was a publican. Despised of the Jew who trusted Christ as a Savior. And then, the Bible reveals to us what proves the fact that he trusted Christ and that he was seeking to restore. He says, I will go to those that I've lied and cheated and I will restore fourfold. No, no, no. Zacchaeus just 
Give back what you owe them. No. Fourfold. You see, Jacob in that moment is a different Jacob. <laughs> Not only because we see in the meeting how he conducted himself, but then he went, go, uh, went beyond to go about the process of restoration. And really he went beyond and, see, and sought to uh, repair, if you would, the harm that he did. And I believe we can evidence here the difference in Jacob. Jacob, the last time Esau saw him, was only a taker. He was a deceiver. He took from Esau. He lied to his father. That's the kind of man he was. But now we know that he's different because he is taking nothing. He is only giving. And what he is giving seems to be too much. You see, that is a different Jacob. We can never say in our lives, God has worked in my life, and there be no evidence in our daily walk with God. We cannot say that. You know, we have people who love to sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But if you ask them to serve God, they want nothing to do with God. Let me, I just want to sing that I love Jesus. Don't ask me to come to church or to do anything for the Lord. or Don't ask me to do anything. There is no such thing in the Christian life. The man and the woman who has been changed, who is under the control of God, that life always has evidence that accompanies that life, that demonstrates and shows the work that God has done in that person's life. It is always evident. It is never hidden. Christ told his disciples, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We certainly are not saved by works, but works certainly testify that we know the Lord. And so may the Lord help us to take those truths and to consider our own lives. There's a different Jacob. Is there a different us through the process of time as God works in our lives?